this week's program, we're going to be talking to somebody who went from wine production through to beer production. We're going to replay the mental health as far as the women is concerned because there is still a lot of concern about that. But in a moment or two, it's animal health prevention and cure. Start off really with vaccines, where we are at with that. Yeah, so I um, thought it's quite timely to, to raise the flag again for clostridial vaccines, the five and one type, the old true store water vaccines. Still to this day, after many, many years, and as I've just said, it's probably one of the oldest really commercially uh, viable vaccines that have been used in, far, in the farming industry. They're still to this day one of the cheapest and, and, and best insurance um, forms that you've got against a lot of very fatal diseases and, and quite economically devastating diseases potentially. So um, I guess there's two ways that these vaccines are commonly used and it, it involves an understanding of the differences in the two class of clostridial vaccine. So we have a multivalent uh, vaccine often traditionally was the old five and one we called five and one vaccine which was a combination of of uh, antigens against a number of clostridial bugs or sudden death type bugs including tetanus pulpy kidney uh, malignant edema these types of diseases these traditionally in the sheeping industry in the sheep farming industry um, are generally given pre lamb um, they provide a wide range of cover against a number of clostridial diseases and if they're given to an animal that's already been sensitised prior, at prior times in its life and they're given it about four to six weeks before the, lamb, the new lambs are born, then we get a really good passage of immunity through the first milk of the ewe into the, into the lamb and we get really good protection invoked to the lamb um, in that way. And that's very, very different from the way that we use lamb vaccine. So if people you know, realise that there's a difference between what's in lamb vaccine and what's in 5 and 1 vaccine, we're on the right, right path. So lamb vaccine uh, contains cover for pulpy kidney, but particularly um, it contains ready-made antibodies, already made, actually used, made in a Percheron horse actually, against tetanus toxin. And so the prime role for for lamb vaccine is given at marking at, at tailing because we end up with a tailing wound and that traditionally was very very prone to be getting the entry point to the tetanus bug which would result in losses from tetanus. So lamb vaccine will give us ready-made immunity um, right at the time that it's given but that lasts for only a period of about 10 days and so it covers that marking or that that tailing period but then the immunity will wane again um, and so if you're wanting good robust cover, then I think pre use of pre lamb vaccine um, with five and one in the ewe, um, and that means that those animals must be sensitised. So all your replacement stock, once you've got that worked out, you need to embark on a perhaps with your vet on a good system of uh, of sensitising the animals so that each year before they lamb, you can boost them and get a really good immunity peak that will be passed on to the lamb and if we're relying on lamb vaccine there's two things to understand one is the immunity is only very short lived for tetanus in particular and if you wanted ongoing immunity you'd need further boost so often these are done at, at weaning um, so the first primary dose of lamb vaccine given at, at uh, marking or at tailing and then a consolidating boost against pulpy kidney again uh, at weaning but but what, do you, what do you mean by sensitising? Okay, so when we invoke, traditionally when we invoke immunity uh, in, in with vaccine, especially with killed vaccines, which is what we're talking about here, the first exposure to the vaccine doesn't invoke a really good immune response. It what we call primes the immune system. And so we have immune cells circulating and they'll come into this, <coughs> they'll come into contact with this vaccine entity and go, hey, this is a foreign this is a foreign invader here, um, I'm going to remember what you look like and the next time you're trying to cause trouble in, in this part of town I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to get all my mates over and we're going to sort you out. And so on a sec it's not until we get a second exposure that we've got the immune system primed up and ready to act that on the second exposure we get a, we get a very good robust immune response. So most killed vaccine require at least two exposures, sometimes three. 
And so when I talk about sensitizing, I mean that, that those animals have got a primed up immune system, they've generally had two exposures earlier in life, and then we can rely on that on that just booster function of the immune system when we need really good high levels of immunity, such as just before lambing when we got high when we want high levels of antibody to be passage through the colostral milk, the first milk that the mammal makes, onto the offspring. When do we use seven and one? Seven and one <coughs> is topical in recent years. It's kind of gone a little bit um, off the on the wayside a little bit. I mean, then there was even some ten and ones around the place at some stage. Um, they involve clostridial vaccine as well as leptospirosis, so a protection against lepto. And that's a particularly important disease in the dairy industry. Um, and with the value of the inherent higher value of dairy cows, um, five and one clostridial protection was always deemed to be quite important, and lepto protection also being important. And so it was a way of vaccine companies to incorporate all of them into the same system and get a, a good robust immunity. Of course, the main reason why dairy cows or dairy animals are a very high risk is one of the main transfer mechanisms of leptospirosis is in the urine. And in, when we're in milking sheds, of course, milking Splash. walkers, <coughs> yeah. and the big risks, just so people are aware when we're talking about lepto or leptospirosis, the big, and the, the, the big flag wave for the disease is that it's a zoonosis. So it's particularly debilitating when humans catch the disease. It has relatively low, low effects animal health wise on on and on the animals per se i mean we have some diseases but we don't have the big the big issue um is public health and so uh that's why lepto uh, vaccine has been a big has been a biggie in the dairy industry because it's been shown that immune animals don't shed leptospirosis bugs very well and so hence we protect the people working around those animals from that disease what about beef cattle Beef cattle again, um, with five and one, or with the with your standard clostridial vaccines, um, you can vaccinate animals for many, many decades um, and still be on top financially when it comes to saving one one well-grown animal. And so, some there are some particular diseases of beef animals that that are maybe a little bit more. Uh, higher on the list when we talk about clostridial vaccines and clostridial diseases, and black leg would be one of them. So when we've got prime beef animals, they're often a bit you know, rough and tumble. We've got steers or bull, bull beef that's being grazed, and of course they, they're they more prone to getting damage to their muscle tissue and things by getting knocked around or run through the yards, and that's a prime environment. If there's spores, if there's these black leg spores sitting in the muscle tissue, once we get a bruise set up, <coughs> poor oxygen level to the bruise and that's what starts the disease going. So very, very cheap, very cost efficient and easy to do to protect the animals. Nick, thank you very much indeed. Craft beer is becoming a very big industry so it's no wonder that a top winemaker went into brewing. Alex, the, the Geeson boys are known for wine and now you're known as the, as the Kaiser Brothers. The Kaiser Brothers, yes. So what's the history behind your becoming a brewer? Well, uh, there's actually Kaiser in my veins. My mother, my mother's mother is a born Kaiser and her two brothers were running the breweries in the 1930s. So um, yeah, my grandmother grew up in a brewery and um, as she obviously married off uh, a gentleman who had the, the stone plant where we are the stone masons originally in Germany. Uh, that's where the, the beer line runs probably a bit deeper actually than uh, the wine line. So the, the, the history of the recipes you're using goes even further back than that? They go back to great-grandfather Leonard who started in the 1860s uh, from a communal brewing who became the brewer in the village which is in northeast Bavaria close to the Czechoslovakian border so hence the affinity to the Pilsner which is uh, again the hops will help uh, in the old days to preserve the beer longer and uh, yes, yeah, so when we linked up as uh, family, well, cousins as we would call them, <laughs> in Kiwi, uh, ways, uh, they, were, they opened up their houses, so to speak, and had boxes and boxes of old uh, uh, stuff from the brewery. And we asked if we could have some of the daily brew records. So 
they showed us everything. The brewery, unfortunately, in the 70s uh, wasn't viable anymore and the remaining uh, relatives sold it off. So yes, we came back with um, a box full of stuff and uh, they're all very delighted that the, uh, the name is resurrected. And uh, as per usual with family, they want to see the odd free sample as well. So as we it's start- quality controlled, Alex. It could be regarded <laughs> as that, but it's great to share that when uh, there's such a good deep uh, deep and strong family uh, history in beer brewing. So the, the family would have lived literally in the brewery? That was then the case, yep, yep, that was the case. They lived and uh, uh, had also that was a tradition because bottled beer wasn't sort of packaged beer wasn't in, in uh, well, just not the way it was done. So they had a brew pub. So they would make uh, lunch and sold beer and uh, it was a communal, probably the meeting point in the village after five o'clock when everybody finished work. Had a couple of steins of beer and then they toddled home again. So the recipes that you've brought back to New Zealand are pretty similar? Well, as Dickie explained, it's not rocket science. We still use, just like the German purity laws, we use still the same ingredients. Um, slightly grown on different soil types, probably different between a Invercargill potato and an Auckland potato, grown on different soil types, different flavours. But basically we do the same and uh, certain things get adjusted to get um, what you would call, make it palatable for the local, for the local markets. There's no point of uh, doing something that at the end uh, is called a too Germanic or too, too European. Uh, you still need to sell it. You, when you started Giesens, listened to the consumers and adapted. Are you doing the same thing with your beer? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's good to go uh, to these um, beer festivals and uh, in-store tastings and supermarkets and the feedback is definitely coming back. We, for example, here we were running too high a carbonization, so the beer was too, too frothy, too foamy. So we quickly sort of readjusted that over uh, two or three bottling runs that uh, too gassy a beer gives you that repetitiveness and uh, that was something we very quickly learned. Uh, we increased actually the, the hoppiness, the bitterness in the beer a bit because it suited the Pilsner style better. And uh, yes, now it's an ongoing process to innovate and to learn, definitely. Now your head brewer has suggested that you're, you're making beer for, it, for a lot of different palates including males and females. Well, that's that's very true, yes, we have uh, some seasonal beers that were very fruity, we used tangerine juice and uh, used the tangerines, uh, the peel in the brewing process, so that was a very floral, uh, refreshing drink that um, again has appeal uh, both sides of the gender and um, you have, uh, there's no such thing anymore to say one, uh, one wine style or one beer style is, uh, is perfectly suited only for the female or for the male gender. It's just, uh, it's a bit like uh, children who grab her, my daughters grab my jeans and they're not worried that it's a male cut and they're fine, you know. So uh, you, can't, you can't just make that uh, generalization anymore. It used to be, but definitely not these days. Was it an easy transition to go from winemaking into both? I would say yes, because uh, fermenting a sweet base, being grape juice or the word, uh, this yeast and the, the technology that you see around us here with stainless steel tanks, refrigeration, um, that is, runs very, very parallel. Where you have to learn and listen is really the, uh, the difference that uh, beer, unless you pasteurize, has a different shelf life to wine, so you have a different sanit sanitation requirements, which probably a notch up on winemaking, but uh, overall, very similar processes. And you're quite happy being a boutique and small? Oh yes, it's fun. It's something different. When you have a large winery, you need somewhere, uh, a small, uh, small little brewery that um, probably takes all the returned earnings back into the brewery. <laughs> it's not cheap to do it right, but at the same time, uh, the, the interesting thing is with winemaking, we only get one shot once a year. So it's a huge window um, in a very short time frame. Where here with brewing, you can plot along, plot along. This plant here has capacity to make half a million liters of beer over 360 days. 
where if you look at mega plants in, in Europe of the large uh, corporate brewers, they would do uh, what we do in a year, they would do it in, in one shift. You know? So it's all horses with courses, large is not necessarily beautiful, uh, here it's set up to really have the flexibility to be adaptive to the market and it gives us a chance to, to branch out in the future probably doing something more also that really I see a huge market coming up uh, is really making good soft drinks, the good lemonades, the good elder, elderflower cordials, uh, slightly carbonated or blended with some modern food, say something with fajoa and elderflower, they are opportunities. So this plant here uh, with its small tanks and uh, the small setup in bottling gives us a chance to go into these things that our grandparents used to have, where now with the, uh, the large format corporate's work is that just they dictate what you have to drink and eat. And I think uh, there's a certain segment in society, they uh, say, yeah, I get it while they exist, but I don't buy into it anymore, and I want something really where I can trace back the origins to the maker. And it's, I think, craft brewers and uh, it runs along the same vein as the, the farmer's market movement and uh, do the supermarkets like the uh, farmer's markets? I don't think so, but they're here to stay. The same as small breweries are here to stay. Yes, they can't. So the obvious question, you're producing very, very good international style beers. Where can you find it? Well, that is slightly an advantage that we have that with uh, our wine business we already call on uh, supermarkets and we call on uh, restaurants, cafes and bars so we have a bit of a, a line into these places uh, depending on the openness and uh, business mindedness of the individual either supermarket or cafe or bar if they can I think there's a, a big opening for these places to have a point of difference to their competitors by going local. There's a lot of debate about what we're eating and the fact that we're a lot of our stuff that we do eat is full of preservatives. I mean, you hear stories about hamburgers that have been left on a windowsill for six months and none of it has gone mouldy. So are we really in trouble when it comes to preservatives and what we are eating? There's those who would suggest that if it doesn't get mouldy, you shouldn't eat it because it's got too much in the way of preservatives. We are starting to become very, very strong on using the used by date. And in fact, if people are sort of looking at that, they'll be saying, well, I'm not going to drink that or eat that because it's past the best used date. The other side of that coin are people are saying that it's a very good marketing ploy because a lot of stuff is wasted because even though it was perfectly OK, it has been thrown out. So where is the balance? What should we eat and what are our real bodies made of and why should they be treated a bit more as a temple rather than an entertainment centre. Let's find out about we are in fact what we eat. Carl, we are what we eat? Very true. Um, we see that every day in our modern day life that we're eating these processed carbohydrates, um, highly processed foods that are having a major effect on us. They make us obese, um, have heart disease rates going through the roof, and many other things going on with us. And we really need to stick to the, the natural foods that are just the way they are in nature. Most people would say we do eat natural food though. Well, they like to use a bit of a slang term for it. It's, it's natural if it's uh, a food product that's been processed for, you know, a hundred times for to change it into something that's not even anything that we naturally know what it is. A piece of bread doesn't look like that when it's growing. There's no bread tree. There's no pasta tree. They come from this, this thing that we wouldn't typically eat, this grain that we wouldn't grab off and eat as is. It tastes pretty bad when we do that. And we process it down into this white little powder that we then put into a, a, a formula with eggs and milk and all this other stuff. And we make it grow into this loaf of bread that we then can actually stomach to eat. And this is the type of food that we're eating a majority of. Instead of having that be a tiny portion of what we eat, we should be eating more um, vegetables, more fruits, more of the natural meats, nuts, seeds, those things that occur in nature, the form that we find them, without having to process them and, and grind them up and do all this other stuff to them. Is that why we've got an epidemic of gluten resistant or gluten tolerance? 
That, that's one of the explanations for it. There's a few explanations. There's um, how much we're processing it, um, the genetic modification to it that happens in, in the laboratories, um, and the amount that we're consuming as well. Because um, people today, they eat more of that processed food and they don't exercise as much as they used to. It was a lot harder on the farm you know, 50, 100 years ago when the, the tractor was uh, a horse dragging the plow behind it and you're steering everything. And, and there's still a lot of long hours, still a lot of going on, but it's not as physically demanding in society for everyone. So it's, if it doesn't go moldy, we shouldn't eat it perhaps. That's, that's a very good way to think of it. If it's not something that's gonna break down and if the bugs don't wanna eat it, you definitely don't wanna eat it. So if it's not gonna be broken down and you know, go moldy or start to dis disintegrating, that's what you really have to look at. So vegetables, you have a, a little bit of a shelf life on them, about three, four days, and you better have them down by that, otherwise they're looking pretty, pretty bad. Same with the fruits and, and the meat when you refrigerate, you got a similar type of lifeline for it. So the, the natural things existing, the natural bugs that exist will eat them because they're, they're edible. But the, the breads, the pastas, those things, they, they don't touch it. How much what happens in the gut leads to other problems in the body? Oh, it's, it's, we're, we're just scraping the top of this part of science right now is just how much the, the, the gut-brain connection is actually connected. And we know in plenty of studies how um, the, the probiotics that you have in your gut, the intestinal colonies that you have of bacteria, um, can completely affect your brain, they can affect your, your overall health, they can affect back pain, being a chiropractor. Um, they, they can affect all these different aspects of your health, and we, ba we know barely any of it. So getting in the forefront and just eating these natural foods like uh, sauerkraut, um, drinking kombucha, um, and, and other, other natural fermented foods is what we really have to do to stay on top of this epidemic. So we, it's okay to, to drink distilled and, and brewed though. <laughs> Uh, well, that, that can be that can be debated um, a little bit uh, a little bit in, in, in moderation um, is is okay with just about anything. But you know, one drink for women and two drinks for men a day at most, and that's what we want to stick to at the most of that. And that's going to be quite processed and have another sit into that processed foods with the high sugar content to it. We probably just lost most of the audience. Well, saying <laughs> we we all, we all know deep down that we have to have have a little bit of moderation with that. And if I were to say, oh yeah, you have as much as you want, it, it just wouldn't sit right, I don't think, anyway. So we all know that you gotta be a little better on that, but the reason we crave those sugary things, the reason we crave those drinks at the end of a long, hard day is the stress response. That's what we really have to manage in order to, to manage that, that need for it. Um, the, the stress response um, starts playing uh, an effect with our hormones, cortisol and insulin and that whole pathway. And once we start getting that stress going up and down, and we start having sugar cravings that go up and down. And at the end of the day, nothing quite relaxes a lot of people as much as just having you know a gin and tonic or a beer or whatever it is because of that stress response and a way to think about this is um, even if you don't drink the beer and you see the old businessman that's been in business for a long time lots of stress they almost always have a beer belly and it's not even even if they don't drink it's because the stress and the cortisol put weight on right here and that's going to be the the cause behind it so we have to manage our stress on a daily basis with our activities our foods um, our, our lifestyle and that's how we get in front of the food, because if you do one without the other, it will fail. If you eat the right foods without managing the stress, the stress will overcome your desire to eat healthy, and it will make you have those bad things. But if you put in the stress reduction activities, you eat the right foods, and you just get the mindset around being healthier, all of it together will actually move you in that right direction and make everything possible. So we shouldn't probably answer the core by having desserts. The way the paleo diet does the dessert is, is a better way. So have the, th have the things that naturally exist the way they are in nature. So I don't mean it's, it, it's been derived from something that was once as it was in nature. Um, I mean something like honey. You can find honey in the jar exactly as it is in nature. They just take it, put it in the jar, and sell it to you. Um, maple syrup is pretty much exactly the same. They boil it for a little while to get rid of the extra water, but it's pretty much the way you would see it in nature. Um, and uh, dates and fruits, these things are as you find them in nature. And consuming them that way, consuming them the way that the farmers grow them, is exactly what we need to do, rather than process them for, for ages in between. So as we said at the, at the beginning, yeah. you are what you eat. You are what you eat. We've known this for years, and it's ever becoming more true every day. He certainly makes a lot of sense, doesn't he? The interesting thing is we're going to be staying with mental health or looking after ourselves and making sure that we are the best that we possibly can straight after the break when we rerun the story that we did about 
mental health, not only just regular mental health, but also about specifically women's mental health. They, in many, many cases, are the ones who are carrying huge burdens. And I think, gentlemen, everybody should be watching this, especially husbands, partners and spouses, because you really do need to know how the matriarch of the family is able to handle things. That's here on On The Land in a moment or two. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try Groshaw Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with Groshaw from KiwiCare. Depression. Yes, it does hit both genders and yes, it will hit all age groups, but it seems that women have got their own area of concern, basically. They take a lot onto their own shoulders and being the sort of the, the family glue, for the want of a better term, invariably they won't show it to anybody. So what we've done is we've gone to some experts to find out what specifically we can talk about as far as women and depression. I've got my own unique view on what depression is, and I'll let you know, but to set the stage, let's talk about physically for a minute. Physically, you don't go to the doctors every time something's wrong, because your body's pretty good at healing itself. But occasionally it can't, so you go to the doctors and get a bit of extra help. But imagine if you'd never been to the doctors your whole life. Imagine what state you've been physically. Like, I don't even know if I'd still be alive, <laughs> but if I was, it would not be a pretty sight. Now, that's a state some people are in emotionally because it's the same with emotions. A lot of emotions, we can process them, resolve them, come out the other end on our own. You know, some take a bit longer than others, like grief, but we're pretty good at getting over them ourselves. But occasionally we can't. Do we have the culture of taking, you know, taking you to see someone to help with your emotions? No, we don't. So they stay with you, and they stay with you. And every year you live, not only are these emotions staying with you, but you're kind of adding more every year, and it builds up to become this overwhelming burden. One of my clients described it as like a backpack full of rocks that she'd been carrying around with her. And she said, I didn't even know I, you know, I, I had it until you took it off me, which is pretty cool. But I think that's a really good analogy. I love that one. Like uh, to me, depression is like, some people call it, you know, a, like a black overcoat. But to me, it's like a backpack full of rocks. It's quite an important tool to be able to do is just to listen to people. Um, and then of course, um, if they have mental health problems or depressions, then we need to decide um, do we refer them to a counsellor? Um, do they just need to talk to someone who is not a friend or a family member? Sometimes they just need to talk. Um, it's, it's interesting sometimes just by talking with people and talking through their problems um, can give them some, um, some help as to how they sort out their problems. If someone is obviously very depressed then of course um, we need to decide whether we refer them for counselling immediately or do they require some medications and sometimes the medications might be just to help them sleep and switch off their brains so that they can cope a bit better uh, or we sometimes immediately will put them on to an antidepressant. Um, so, so there are a lot of options. So what are the symptoms? How do you know the difference between being very un being unhappy and being depressed. And I think unhappiness doesn't make your life worse, but depression does. If that makes any sense at all, let me explain. For instance, one of the things that we can do when we're depressed is we look for ways to distract ourselves from those thoughts and feelings we don't want to have. And that can be very destructive because we'll look to things like alcohol. Why do so many people come home on a Friday night or go out on a Friday night and have a few drinks? Because it works fantastically. It blocks out all those thoughts and feelings about work that we don't want to have and it keeps them away. I'm not saying you should do that, I'm just saying it works. 
so do drugs, so does smoking. Smoking is well known to dampen down uncomfortable feelings and alleviate stress. But the problem is it's temporary. And as it's effects wear off, much like alcohol, you have to, you know, re-tranquilise yourself with something else. But there's other things that we can do, like for instance, we might over shop, you know, spending every time we go out shopping, get a, you know, I do, I get a real sense of joy when I buy something that I really like. And so that can be like some person's equivalent of drinking or smoking gambling of course or there's the whole overworking or keeping busy that's where you get gym junkies and or people that just never relax and they're always doing something one of the reasons why we're always busy and we all know people like this is because we don't give ourselves time to think or feel so that can be a symptom that we've got something more than just a generalized unhappiness when we're actually doing something that is harming us or the people around us in some way those who are suffering from it will invariably hide it. Some women, of course, will, will hide it. Um, there is the, the pride aspect for many people that they don't want to be seen to be weak um, or not coping. Many people don't, you know, you know are, are great at putting on a, a good coping face and, um, and are good at, at hiding the way things really are going. It's only really people close to them who will recognise, well, there's, there's something not quite right. And that's usually, of course, a partner or a close family member. We do hide it. There's a culture, as you know, Rob, of, you know, whenever, if I say to you, how are you today? You're going to say good things. And there's a culture of, oh, if I say that I'm not good, what will they think? And so we hide it and we put on the brave face. And especially if we're an outgoing sort of bubbly type of personality, we tend to think that's what people like about me. I've got to give them that. If I'm not that person, they're not going to like me at all. So I have to keep being that person. And so we put on our mask and we build our energy up when we're out. And that actually makes us feel even worse. That actually makes our depression worse when we're playing that role because it's using up the little energy that we have. One of the things about depression is that it does sap our energy. And so we have to, you know how you've got a money budget and you have to spend your money wisely? Well, we've got an energy budget as well. And we have to spend our energy wisely. And when you are unhappy or depressed, you've got a lot less energy. So spending it on playing the role that you think people want you to play is not a wise use of it. And we don't talk about it. And that's partly due to the culture that we feel this pressure to be this happy person that we think everyone wants us to be and that they won't like us or think that we're a failure if we're not. So the culture comes into it and the second reason we don't often talk about it is talking often doesn't help. Here's an interesting fact, and then some people may disagree with this, but this is a fact that I've, um, I've read somewhere. Research shows that the average amount of time someone goes to therapy for is 10 years. Well, something's not working, perhaps this is an American figure, but something's not working if you're going to therapy for 10 years. You know, often just talking about our problems doesn't change them. And so, uh, you know a wee bit about me and what I do, Rob, and one of the, and I'm not a counsellor. I don't, I don't have people come to me and just talk, so I don't see a lot of value in that. They can do that, but I like to actually change the reasons why they're feeling the way they're feeling. And, and I use a form of energy psychology known as EFT. And I'll just quote Dr. Bruce Lipton for a moment, who's an amazing man. And he says, and this is no offence to any counsellors because there's some wonderful ones out there who are very holistic, but some of them are working just with the mind. And of course, we're not just a mind, are we? I mean, we're mind, body and spirit. And so he says, and this is a quote from Dr. Bruce Lipton, he says, the problem with counselling is you go along and you talk about things. And you, you come to some realisations and you think, hmm, now I understand myself. I am the way I am because this happened to me or this didn't happen to me. Now I understand myself. I can change, you say to yourself. And he says, no, you can't. Because a lot of your behaviour, thoughts, and um, thoughts, emotions, behaviours are programmes running in the subconscious mind. And he says the subconscious mind is like a tape player. It can only play the program it's got. You can talk to a tape um, for as long as you like and ask it to change, and it can't. It can only play what's loaded onto it. And he says the subconscious mind is like that. So just realising and, and saying to yourself, oh, I can change, will not work. And he says EFT, which of course is the form of energy psychology I use, he says EFT is the, the equivalent of pressing the record button and recording over it. 
So that's why I use this form of energy psychology. But you're right that just talking often doesn't work and so people don't go. And we're talking about culture again. I mean, if we talk about people like the police, you know, they see some terrible things, some quite traumatic things. And they have quite a culture, so I'm told, that they don't go and talk about it because they've got the culture of let's just be tough and let's, well, we'll go and have a beer and, you know, we'll just forget about it. And I think a lot of rural people have, because, you know, it's a, it can be a bit of a tough life, a lot of rural people have that, like, let's just be strong. No, we won't talk about it. There's other people going through this. They seem to be coping. Oh, they seem to be coping. Oh, he seems to be coping. Perhaps I'll just, I'm a, I better cope as well. I'll just... And, of course, by not talking about it, that can lead to a suicide situation that nobody saw coming. Yes, because they've been wearing their mask when they're around other people. This mask that I'm doing well, I'm happy, perhaps the extrovert mask. And yet inside they've been getting worse and worse and worse because that's been sapping their energy and making them feel more depressed because the more they play that role, the more they realise that they can't keep playing it. And the more they feel like a failure and a fake, fake is a word I hear a lot. A lot of people say to me, I feel like a real fake. And that's not a way to live your life. We've got to be authentic. And so people don't see it coming, partly because people are hiding it and wearing the mask, partly because people are using, I call them tranquilizers, things like alcohol, you know, shopping, eating. Oh, we forgot to mention the eating one before. Overeating or comfort eating is a way also, much like alcohol and smoking is, of distracting us from thoughts and feelings we don't want to have. It works wonderfully. The funny thing is, you don't eat that bit of chocolate cake and then feel better about yourself, you actually feel worse. But you're feeling worse about something completely different to what you're feeling bad about before. So it actually still works. So therefore the subject really is, talk to somebody. Just find somebody who you think will understand. Well, if, as a human being, you are feeling really low on mood and you're feeling hopeless and miserable, and it's persisting, and it's not just transitory, then you, you, you do need to have the courage to ask for assistance, because there is plenty of assistance available. If only you ask, and you know who to ask assistance from. So um, the, the first thing, as I would say, would be to have the courage or have the strength to, I would say, go and see your doctor. Um, and tell your doctor that you're feeling, how you're feeling. Often, depression can be put down to the fact that we are putting too much emphasis on ourselves and the risk of failure. And if I asked everyone in the room what their idea of success was, everyone would have a different answer. And there can be problems that arise when someone's version of success means this and I can't get there. So if I can't get there, I have failed, I'm a loser, I'm not good enough, are all thoughts that we have about ourselves. So you will not be happy if your version of success is too high and too unachievable. And we get those from all sorts of places, from our parents, from, from culture as well. And one of the things I do with my clients is help them to change their definition of success so that they, they don't feel that they're failing. And the other interesting thing is that a lot of research has shown that happiness has nothing, well, not nothing, happiness has only 10% to do with your life circumstances. So if you're doing really, really well, you're achieving, you're financially well off, everything's going great, perhaps you're in a great relationship, that accounts for 10% of your happiness. 90% has nothing to do with what is or isn't happening in your life. 90% is to do with your mindset, and that's, how to be happy is actually a learned skill. It's just the problem is that most people haven't learned it. And if your parents didn't know how to be happy, how can they possibly teach you? I didn't learn how to be happy until I was in my 30s, so it was a bit late in life. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy she needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. 
I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Sharon, as a young woman, went through some very serious cancer. Let's hear her story and what got her through her depression. When I was only 32, I was given just a few months to live with cancer. I was in a lot of pain. I was um, very sick, couldn't breathe without coughing. I was hospitalised just about full time and I had my three children at home um, waiting for me and wondering if mum had come home at any stage soon. And things did get so tough at times that I actually didn't want to go on. I, the pain was just so bad, I thought it's got to stop, you know, but I knew I had these three little girls at home and I had to go home to them. You know, they, they just pull you through the other side and, and, and keep me going when I would have given up otherwise. It's, it's, yeah, the physical is how can I go on in this physical state? Will I get to go on? They've told me I can't. They've said there's no way you can live through this. Just to be as comfortable as possible, get your affairs in order and um, ring us when you need to get away from home. But then they decided to give me some treatment that, that may make me a little more comfortable and it did, it, it worked miracles. And I, I did get better eventually, but yeah, in that dark time in hospital for a whole year, I'd only get home for a couple of days at a time and then I'd be rushed back because something would go wrong, the balances would get out, my blood pressure would drop or something like that, I'd get dehydrated and get rushed back to hospital. And there was no certainty in life, you know, there was nothing to say. I, I will get home. And the thing that I had to hang on to was being a mum. And when I was home, even though I was bedridden, there was times when, you know, the kids would go come bounding into my room to ask something and, and I'd, you know, wrap them up in my blankets and my mum would come in and say, now, don't disturb your mum, she's not well, you know. You come away and let mum sleep. But really, it was all I had to hang on to. I wanted to still be a mum. You know, and, and I didn't feel anything could take that away. I was a mum. And it, it just, yeah. I fought for those kids tooth and nail because I wasn't leaving them behind. Who knows what, what would have happened to them? You know, all the thoughts that go through your head, what will happen if you're not there? They all went through mine and, yeah, and I did. I thought at those times when I felt I couldn't go on, that was what pulled me through. And her husband wasn't spared either. My husband, my husband's a, a lovely, lovely man and an extremely successful farmer. He makes me proud every day. But he started getting grumpy and nobody knew why. There'd been a family issue that, I thought it triggered this grumpiness, but I thought oh, it'll go away when he sort of gets over the hurt. And he got grumpier and grumpier and weeks stretched into months and months turned into years. And, you know, he lost his joy for life. He wasn't, when the grandkids bounded in, he, he didn't enjoy them leaping on him anymore. He'd sort of go, oh, you know, oh, we don't get any time to ourselves. And he'd always loved them being there. It was, you know, his absolute pleasure time. And eventually we realised that, that maybe he were a little depressed for whatever reason, but in him it came out as grumpy. Just a, yeah, lost his joy and happiness. And um, we worked our way through that idea that that was possible and once it was recognised and we could move forward, he came back and he's a lovely man again. And he's back to the man I married 30-something years ago. So where do we look for help? 
that's important to understand that many people hide their depression because they don't equate a depression as they would with any other illness such as having high blood pressure or diabetes or uh, angina. They view, they, they, they think it's just something that I can pull my socks up and I, and I need to be stronger and tougher and I'll get over it. When in fact um, your central nervous system and the bag of chemicals and neurotransmitters is quite complex and can be determining your mood and, and your outlook on life and how you're interacting with other human beings. So, so then, you, then there's something wrong and there is assistance available. All I would say from a GP's perspective is, um, I would like to be seen as to being accessible. You, you come, you come and ask for an appointment and we will see you. And um, so, so access is important. You need to be able to access someone to help you. Um, you need to feel welcomed and not judged. You know, don't judge people because, you know, it's always, you could be me. I mean, I could be you. That's what I always think. And I could be you easily. So how would I feel if I were you? I would really like to be able to come to someone who made me feel like you're not alone. And we've, we've all got these problems. And so, so we don't pretend that none of us are uh, um, immune from it and then you just want someone to help you don't you so what's the help going to be maybe some medications maybe just listening in a conversation or maybe referring to someone who is quite independent of your friends and family and social um, surrounds and maybe that's all that's required there are people in the rural districts who are there to help well I believe you should talk to anybody you can I think you need to be brave enough to say I think something might not be right. But for farmers, these rural support trusts are very helpful and they can take you right to the right people. Your GP is there to help you. Um, sometimes you have to be a little bit more forceful and actually say, you know, I really think I may be a little depressed or something. Um, otherwise it might not be recognised as that. And Rural Women, we are a great networking team and we just love standing by each other. And we also have places that, you know, things we can tap into to help. Um, so there's many places, there's, you know, Lifeline, lots of, lots of support places, but even if it's to talk to a friend and say, you know, I think I'm feeling a bit down in the dumps. She's really talking about that feeling of just being flat. And sometimes it is just flat or, you know, you just drop something and you think, oh, when you should have just gone, oh, I dropped that. You know, things affect you that maybe don't need to. The little things start worrying you instead of the big things that used to before. And I think, you know, I, I believe we all go there at some stage to some degree but it is recognising it and knowing that you can share it and other people can help you. Now the good thing is that there is protection out there. You can actually buy some insurance which is going to get you through when you are in trouble. Yes, mental health. Uh, that's, mental health uh, covers uh, things like stress, anxiety and depression. Um, it's interesting that that's not an ACC event. So for ACC, uh, to be covered under ACC, that has to be an accident, and mental health is not an accident, it's an illness. So that doesn't come under their categories. So really important that people have a contract that's based around illness and injury. Um, and being self-employed, one of your biggest risks is uh, mental health. Um, so a lot of pressures on people that have got their own business, uh, obviously it's stressful, uh, they can be, you know, get anxious about their business uh, and get depressed. All of those things go hand in hand. So um, for a self-employed person it's really important that they've got some good covers in place that will protect them in, at those moments. Um, statistics from the companies um, show that for disability covers about 17% of their claims are based around mental health. Uh, so that's quite a high proportion of claims down to that area. 
and um, not just female uh, based, uh, there is a lot of men as well, so um, where people might think that that's something that's um, more based around a female, it's not the case, it's really widespread. So I do trust that that has helped. Just remember that you do not need to hide it because there's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's the old story, if you hurt your leg, you get it treated. If you hurt your heart or there's a problem with your heart, you get that treated. If there's something wrong with your head, it's not a stigma. It's just that it's something that needs to be fixed. There are a lot of people in your corner. All you've got to do is to recognise it and then take whatever action you feel comfortable with. Thank you for watching that because it is very, very important. And if we can save one person from doing something which they didn't really want to do, we have been very successful. We're also working at the moment on one for youth, and that will be the young farmer's main theme when it comes to the Mystery Creek Field Days, early or back in about the middle of next month. It's a very, very serious subject, so we are taking it very, very seriously. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed on the land. But I will be back at the same time. Until then, bye now.